Welcome to Facing Time. I am Jared Zuckerman, and today I am here with my guest and someone I consider to be a thought leader, Jennifer Gould. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, Jared. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Jennifer is a food and real estate columnist at the New York Post and an author. So I'm very excited right now to talk to you because you are on the front lines talking all about the current health crisis and everything we're going through. So let's just jump right into it. Okay. You're, you're all over New York City in the area writing all about the current health crisis. You're on the front lines. You're getting amazing stories. Thank you. What is that experience like being just at the forefront of everything and really just in it? You know, I'm, I'm thankful for the experience of being able to report. I mean, when the crisis started, we stopped going into the newsroom. A lot of us spread out. All the reporters were in the city, were outside the city, but we're talking to people every day. So I'm talking to nurses, to health workers, to restaurant owners. And um, it's really inspiring to see all the really good things people are doing, even in the midst of absolute chaos. So restaurants shut down um, and it's really sad. And there are now, you know, tens of millions of people unemployed. And at the same time, there are top restaurateurs. Some have, are not making an effort, some are. And the ones who are, are turning their uh, beautiful restaurant spaces into commissaries or making meals for New Yorkers in need and for frontline workers. And there is an incredible spirit in the city that means that, um, you know, we'll fight this, we'll, we'll get through it. And it's thanks to every single person out there. I think it's incredible that at a time where, I mean, the facts are at this time, even let's say restaurants that are open, they're not making the same revenue, the income as they were, but yet they are not hesitating to basically donate time and services the food for essential workers and others as well. I think that's really goes to show at heart, you know, restaurants in the community really do serve their communities. Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that more and more. Um, we're seeing bread lines grow because the unemployment figures are going up so high. So now along with regular people who were in soup kitchens, we now have you know, restaurant workers and artists and, and Broadway actors, you know, it's a whole mix of people. But I have restaurant owners telling me that their employees feel really good, like putting bags together. And I had one restaurateur who we profiled say, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a bodega or if you have a three-star Michelin restaurant, you can do something, you can prepare some meals and, and you can you can get them out there. And, and some, this epidemic has really caused a lot of people to refocus and relook at, at um, the food supply chain, how they do business and how they can do better. The flip side is that even when the city reopens, most restaurants won't be able to afford to reopen. If they're forced to operate at 50% capacity, they're still gonna be paying 100% rent and that doesn't work. So, um, so we've got a long, long way to go to get back to whatever the new normal will be. But, uh, but people are working on it and trying to come up with novel ways to do it, whether it's, you know, putting restaurant tables and chairs in parks and sidewalks. I mean, that's what restaurateurs are hoping that the city and the state will allow. But there's got to be ways to start to reopen safely in a way that people can start making money again. Absolutely. One of the things that, and, and it's interesting because we go by our anticipation and sort of our, our gut feelings with what is happening day by day, because there's, there's still so much that's unknown. Right. Right. E even though, you know, the governor's trying to work on his 12 points to reopen this region, there's still so much that's unknown and it could still go backwards. We may not maintain these 12 points. And to your point about restaurants not being able to afford really reopening, you know, everybody's going to be excited. But I, what I anticipate 
is that there's, there's going to be a much lower percentages of restaurants that actually do reopen. And That's it funny. may actually cause possibly more concern. But for the sake of staying positive, uh, you know, restaurants that do stick with this now and they're able to off offer delivery and curbside pickup, hopefully even at 50% capacity, they'll be able to accept in-house dining. But even then, if you're going to have a full staff and even if you have a special shortened menu, your costs are still going to go up and only having 50%, you know, c capacity at the restaurant, it may not necessarily be worth opening at that time, possibly even waiting a little yeah. bit longer. I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues, you know, a lot of people on, on unemployment are making more than they would make going back. You know, if you take in the tips are going to be 50%. A lot of restaurant workers went home, you know, to whatever home state they were, or they moved back in with their parents, or, you know, they actually left the state. So there might be retraining when things reopen again. And the other thing is, there's only going to be one shot. That's what a lot of restaurant owners say, you know, they can't reopen again and then close if they're not making money, you know, that would just be devastating. So this all has to be done really, really carefully. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting, but... New York strong, right? I mean, New York is so strong and just, you know, I've been going back and forth sometimes to the city and just hearing that seven o'clock shout um, and the cheers is uh, so inspiring. It's just amazing. I stand, I'm very fortunate. I'm just going to go like this for a sec because I'm like, so there we go. Uh, didn't work. I go on my balcony at seven o'clock and I just, I just hear it. It's, it's very, uh, it's touching. It is. It really is. It's inspiring. It's moving. Everybody likes to think, you know, especially if you're not from New York, New Yorkers are crazy. They, they, they just rush around. They don't notice things because they just need to get from one place to another. And there's everybody's competing against each other. But really what I've found is when we, we need it most, everybody gets together. 100%. And I felt that on 9-11 and those days after 9-11. And there's something so special about the city. I'm Canadian and the, and the day I really felt like I was a New Yorker was after 9-11, just everyone coming together and it's just very meaningful. All okay, right, Jennifer, I, I spoke to you yesterday on the phone even, right? You, you're always so positive <laughs> and energetic and smiling and happy and everything that you know i want to feel inside <laughs> how do you do this you're you're you you like you know my story you know a little bit as an advisor and social media consultant especially at the beginning of this i was working with many many restaurants me and my team and it was not only personally affecting me but also professionally because it, it just hit both right the industry i was in and it was, it was challenging. Now, in a 24 hour period, you know, I've been through a big challenge because obviously, <laughs> you know, the loss of clients is temporary for me just because of this health crisis. And I've learned to accept that now because <laughs> I've been through my process. And I've had to work very hard because truthfully being happy and feeling fulfilled and positive doesn't come natural. I, I gotta work at it. For you, it just seems like it's in your DNA. It's in your blood. Am I wrong? And then, well, I think I, I think I am that way. I think I am. Um, I think everybody has hardship, and we see it now with with the pandemic. But everybody in their lives, everyone has things to struggle with. And I think for me, it's just a feeling of gratitude, of just being thankful for what you have, and knowing that there's a strength within that you can use to get through whatever it is you're going through because everything is temporary. I mean, even all of this tragedy, I mean, real tragedy. I mean, at this point, we all know people who have died from this pandemic. We know people who've lost their jobs, who've lost their life's work. Like there are really, you know, terrible, terrible things going on, but, um, but there's still a strength. There's still people coming together at funerals, people being there for each other, people taking care of, um, you know, of their friends, of people who are without their families. And there's something really inspiring about that. And there's a way you can really get strength 
from seeing that and being a part of it. So is, is, is this how you maintain such great positive just energy? It just, just Look, you are on the front lines. I mean, you are writing about everything going on. You know, you're, you're in it. And do you ever find moments where you struggle a little bit and you have to kind of put yourself, like remind yourself or is it? Sure. No, I mean, look, it's totally sad to, to do a lot of these things, even to put on a mask and go into a store and find that even if you can buy something, there's nothing to buy. <laughs> you know, there's the, the food that you need isn't there. The cleaning supplies aren't there. And you just think, God, like, when is this, when are we all going to go back to normal? So of course, like it's, it's devastating. It's crushing. We all want our old life lives back, but hopefully you know we can learn from this and and we know that this is a temporary situation i think we're all also learning to live in the moment and that's not necessarily a bad thing but i think what we're living through is war i mean this is like war really and um and so there's just you got to keep strength and and keep talking to people and, and stay connected and helping as much as you can. And, and we're all going to get through this. That's why I created face in time because it was sort of my journey of talking to people I consider to be thought leaders and who are just positive and just m create that motivation and sort of empowerment, you know? So this was sort of this, this, what I'm doing right now is my tool. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I have so many friends in the industry that are just, they're just not working, you know, but I love gratitude. I think gratitude for me is just key of just being thankful for even the small things. It's not, you know, look, I have a roof over my head. I have food in my fridge exactly. and I have a microphone I'm recording and a beautiful webcam, like it's 2002 again, but <laughs> right. you know, I'm, I'm grateful. And I'm so thankful because regardless of what I've been through, right, or what we've been through, there is so many people who are truly, truly struggling. Absolutely. You know, and one of the scare, one of the scariest things I heard, and it was, um, it was the daily, the pot, the New York times podcast. And it was a nurse in new Orleans who was saying she had fought diseases in, in other countries but this was the worst she had ever seen because people are alone. They die alone. They're not surrounded by their family and their loved ones. And after they die, the, the nurses can't even comfort the family members, the loved ones, and sort of walk them through the stages of grief. I mean, you know, it's such a lonely, lonely way to live. We're all, all isolated if we're not outside like this wearing masks and and it's a lonely way to live and it's a lonely way to die and and you know that is that's the horror and then the positive side is hopefully it you know it brings us together we we start looking out for people more and especially people friends of ours who you know who aren't with family members or older people who are alone you know there are ways to reach out so um, there's, we're seeing a lot. We're all seeing a lot and we're all processing a lot. Yeah. I talked to my parents. My parents still live on Long Island, uh, where I grew up in Stony Brook. I talked to them two or three times a day. My dad, my dad's birthday was the beginning of the month and I couldn't even see him. It was so strange. Even yeah. for Mother's Day, I'm just like, oh, when is this going to end? And, you know, my dad just had big surgery in December and even I just feel uncomfortable. You know, even if I had the antibodies test, for example, I, I just won't go. No, absolutely. I, but I, that makes sense. But it sucks. It's hard. It's <laughs> really hard. It's really hard. Where are you, by the way? Okay, because I know you said you were outside in normally, like, are you in your backyard or? Well, I'm, I'm um, in, in the Berkshires. So. In Berkshire. It's beautiful. And today's the perfect day. It it's, really is. It's so nice. <laughs> so good day um i miss the city i miss central park i miss running there so you're a runner a little bit yeah yeah i was supposed to run the new york city marathon last year and i hurt my knee i was running for charity and then 
Yeah, I hurt my knee, so I couldn't do it. Yeah, you got to be careful. I know, but it's days like this that I just want to go run because I feel great. And then 10 minutes in, I'm just like, I, I, I can't Yeah, do you got to be really careful. I guess I'm getting older. What can I say? I'm 38. <laughs> and so there are those signs right now. <laughs> um, so recently, you know, I know you mentioned the story about New Orleans that was covered by the New York Times. Is there a story that you covered recently that really touched you? Yeah, I mean, one one story was with um, a very well-known restaurateur who whose life really has been changed by this pandemic, who really went from, you know, the start of the pandemic thinking, okay, nobody's going to want lemon, lavender, chicken, or whatever as takeout, so what could he do? And, um, you know, it's changed how he thinks about food. He's you know, noticing people in need. He's come up with an idea. This is David, um, Daniel Hum. This is an idea where, you know, you can be in a three-star Michelin restaurant and make really delicious, inexpensive family meals for your staff. And why not make some extra? And, and if what would happen if every single restaurant did that? You know, so um, so stories like that, have been very enlightening for me. Um, you know, I've I've talked to farmers all through the Hudson River Valley, um, dairy farmers, different kinds of farmers who have to dump their milk or get rid of food because our food supply chain is so messed up. And you can have milk, but if you don't have somewhere to store it, what can you do? Or New York City public schools that have frozen food in their freezer since March 13th. I mean, why isn't that going to people in need? So what has struck me so much, you know, before the pandemic, I wrote about new restaurant openings or trends in food. And now I'm really looking at this whole supply, supply chain. And there's so many things that need to be fixed. I mean, we have people who are hungry in one part of the country and in other parts we have farmers dumping milk and killing livestock and and taking you know vegetables out of the ground and having to destroy crops like it's it's crazy so uh so this is highlighted so much this has highlighted so many problems with the healthcare system i mean we're really seeing what the holes, the flaws, the, the things that need to be fixed. So, um, so it, in that sense, it's been really, really enlightening for me. You know, um, on a very fun part, you can now get if you've got um, the farmers who used to sell to all the top restaurants in New York City. You know, they're struggling now. So, what are they doing? They're reinventing themselves. They're doing boxes of their produce and bringing them to the Union Square Green Market or other places. You can now go get the arugula that Jean Georges uses in his restaurants. Um, you know, you can find ways to support your local farmers. And um, and everyone's just pivoting, trying to figure out how they're going to move forward in a way that is both safe, in a way that makes sense, and, and hopefully in a way that will help others too. And speaking about local farmers and or local and small businesses, I'm I it's incredible to see these communities really supporting the restaurants. Uh, it's it's incredible oh. to see, and even at a time when many people, you know, can't necessarily, you know, eat out as much or order food as much because finances are tight. You know, people are, when and if possible, really supporting local and small business. It's incredible. And, you know, bringing your, you know, to your point about food waste, really, or, you know, frozen food sitting in these schools, not really serving a purpose. Uh, even before this, I always felt the food industry in general didn't really either maximize what they were doing or there was a percentage of waste that was allowed. Meanwhile, one of the reasons why restaurants fail is because of waste. 
Right. Right. So I get that. Okay. Well, if it's, if it's wasted food, but even now, why are, you know, there's still so much not being done and there's so much food going to waste. Absolutely. What we need to do, pack it up, put it in the freezer. There are a million organizations out there that all you have to do is call. They will come and pick it up. They will literally walk inside in gloves and a mask and make sure they're safe and they will pick everything up, put it in, you know, sterilized bags, making sure that going from point A to point B, it's safe. And they'll feed people who need it. Um, and there are many people doing that. And I don't want to discredit that. And, and it's, it's incredible to see this happening. But it's like, to your point with schools, I had, hadn't actually thought about that. So yeah, there, I mean, yeah, there are definitely uh, nonprofits that started this before the pandemic that really got into food waste, either from restaurants or corporations. And going forward, hopefully there will be more of that. Yeah, there's just no need for it. And, and it's even economical for the restaurants. They'll do better if, if um, their waste gets taken care of by nonprofits who can feed people with it. It'll be better for them as well. Yeah. So we need to uh, see that. Re yeah, just the, the, call it, the restaurant industry is interesting. I know uh, right in, in Atlanta, they reopened, mm -hmm. right? And the restaurants all reopened. Were they, re correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, I don't think they were even restriction. They just opened, right? With limited restrictions, not as tight as I think it was going to be here in New York or maybe. Yeah, I can't remember exactly. I know we were looking at this a little bit because New York is looking to see how these other states are going to do, you know, what they can learn. Um, I think one of the problems is if customers aren't wearing masks and in Atlanta, people will go into restaurants without masks. How do those kitchen workers feel? How do the restaurant workers feel serving people not wearing masks? They're not so happy. But how do you, as a customer, and maybe this sounds silly, how do you eat if you're wearing a mask? And then oh, you, you only, no, you wear your mask in and you wear it out. So when you're in transition, when you're moving, you wear your mask. When you're sitting down, you don't have to wear your mask. Does it though make the point, I don't know, kind of pointless if you're, if you're okay, you go, you come in the front door, you sit at the table, but then you take your mask off. Isn't it sort of, negating it's sort of contradictive maybe i mean you know i don't know there you you really want to just limit the contact so if you're going in that's why there are small tables if you go in with a certain group of people you know you know if they're if you're living with them usually whatever you know who they are you you kind of feel safe with them and when you're walking, I mean, you could have it and not be affected. And if you're wearing a mask, you're making sure that other people aren't going to get it. You know, if, yeah. if you have some, it's just safer. You know, maybe servers will put uh, food down on a table and you will go get that food so that you're, you're that contact between the server and the customer is limited. I mean, there are so many ways to do it, but the important thing there's so many different levels to this, but one is that people have to feel safer. They're not going to go out. So there's no point for Governor Cuomo to say restaurants can reopen and then A, it's not financially viable for the restaurants to reopen, but B, even if they do reopen, if people don't feel safe going, they're not going to go. It doesn't matter whether they're open or not. So, yeah. so I think it's really important for everybody to take precautions whether you're the customer or the restaurant worker and I think that people will get used to masks like it just won't be a big deal at a certain point like you know hopefully not forever but if it can help you know why not Jennifer and that actually was going to be my my question is what do you feel people are looking for when they're ready to go back into restaurants because I feel Comfort and safety is key and people want to understand what restaurants are doing to have people feel comfortable going back into their favorite places again. And even for social media, I think where we were heading in social media from the food porn, right. it was always transitioning 
in my opinion, to more of a human component. People want to see the people now behind, but it kind of jump started it where we may have been in like two or three years from now, sort of just rapidly brought it up. And I feel that if we can demonstrate on social, if restaurants can demonstrate on social media, what they're doing to feel comfortable and safe, not just another food photo with a caption that says, can't wait to reopen. I don't think that's really demonstrating a level of comfortability for people to go back in. Would you agree or do you have a yeah, different thought? I, I agree with that. I think what's interesting is, is people are really thinking out of the box also. And I think that will inevitably, inevitably be a good thing. So for Monday, I have a story. I'm not going to say who yet because it, it's a, an exclusive for Monday's paper. But, um, <laughs> but someone turned a metal detector into a, a, a scanner, a body temperature scanner. So you walk in, there will be either a red light if you have a fever or a green light to go. I'd be scared. <laughs> right. I mean, you might. But if, if it goes red and you think you don't have a fever, you can go inside and put your wrist to a, another unit on a wall and be scanned. You know, there'll be things like this that will hopefully make people feel safe and that's <laughs> i'm sorry it's like that moment when you're going you're at the airport right imagine you're at jfk it's really busy you think you have everything you think you took everything out of your pockets and you're ready to go through okay. tsa through the scanner <laughs> that's exactly what it's like for some reason you're nervous even though you have no reason to be right <laughs> so i mean it's interesting you know everybody will come up with things differently we there was this video going around i don't know if you saw it about a restaurant in amsterdam and people were eating in these beautiful um, glass greenhouses. Yes. And so then the, the wooden board comes in and the food looks beautiful on it. And nobody touches the, you know, the food. The server's not handing it to you. It's just on this board. It was a really creative way to make something look beautiful. And even the masks were clear plastic shields so you could see people's faces. And it looked really nice. Like there was nothing, there was nothing really, you know, horrible about it or offsetting it was kind of chic in this interesting post pandemic way so um so it'll be really interesting to see what people come up with like how to do things you know i've talked to some you know top top chefs who say like they're not going to do what what restaurants are doing in asia where you have plastic partitions between tables that it's kind of tacky and it's not really a a way to to really enjoy your dinner. So there are certain things we will do. There are certain things we won't do, but whatever it is, it has to, you know, contribute to this feeling of, of safety and security that people will have. And people are going to want to go out. So they're definitely going to want to get back. And they just, the, the restaurant community has to make sure they feel safe to do it. You see, and this is where I'm, 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 I sort of battle with myself because with my thought process, because in one hand, people want to go out. The moment they're like, oh, we could go, at the same time, many are financially struggling, but they still want to go out. Right. So I do believe there's going to be like a, a two to four week period where restaurants are flooded to as much as they're able to be flooded with capacity with guests. And then it's going to, I think, actually die down quickly. Sort of like, you know, when you have a new restaurant grand opening, it's really, really busy. Right. And then it's like, what are we doing to maintain that? It's going to be the same thing. So one is to, when we get the green light to reopen, wait two to three weeks. So you don't flood, you're not flooded with the messages of everybody else saying we're open, right? Two, create an experience. I think people now want an experience. Even when I used to do big sort of events, influencer events, we always said it was an experience. We never said it was an event. I've always believed this, even before everything going on. So I think people want more of an experience and night out because if they don't go out as much, when they do go out, I actually believe they're going to, people are going to be willing to spend a little bit more because they want that night out, that special experience. But then what is that restaurant doing that's not business as usual? Because if they don't adjust and adapt and they reopen their front door to the old environment and not to the new city, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I'm excited. I'm, I'm so excited to see what restaurants are going to do. And I'm also a little concerned because I don't see a lot of restaurants showing what they're doing yet. 
Right. <laughs> well, I think people don't know yet, too, because they're waiting to see what the guidelines are going to be or what they'll be able to do. I mean, there are going to be some really unusual ideas. Like if the city permits restaurants to op to you know set up tables and chairs in the middle of a street that's shut down or take over a sidewalk or go into a park that will bring so much vitality back to the city and people are going to be more comfortable eating outdoors at the start anyway so i mean that could bring back so much life i mean one of the eeriest things now is to walk through the city and see see it empty or see all the stores closed like it's so sad so just imagine what that would look like if, if that goes forward. I mean, that that's a really creative, out of the box way to think, and and it could really work. And I have to admit, Jennifer, I have not been to Manhattan since the day one of confinement. I've literally, I live in a big building. I was, I literally stayed in my area for actually until now. The farthest I've been, I live in Bushwick, so the farthest I've been is Williamsburg. And even then, it, it's really scary to see uh, all these businesses. But I'm excited, and I am excited for this next chapter. And I, I try to stay positive. And I think that with such a tragic event and what's happening, we can use it as an opportunity. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we can use this to sort of give people that sense of happiness and joy when it's time to go back out. And I think restaurants have the ability because restaurant food brings everybody together. I mean, food and music are the two things, right? Uh, so I'm excited for it. And I, if, if streets closed and there were tables out on the streets, like Stone Street, right? So, yes, oh, exactly. I would, I would probably spend all my money because I would just want to just eat out every night. I, I would love it. Really nice. It would be really, really nice. So. Well, I'm excited for when all this happens and you cover this with the New York Post and all, all your uh, all your articles that you're you're publishing, which are which is awesome. I, I love what you're writing about, and um, it's great. So, thank you. This was super fun. Now I know that the mystery question I told you about okay. to kind of just have some fun and end on a positive on a fun note as well. Um, a question that I don't know that you'll ask me, and a question that I'll ask you that you don't know. Um, I kind of just have a silly question because I'm very curious to learn more about you, but you are the guest. So would you like me to ask you first or you ask me first? Um, ask away. <laughs> okay. Um, because you do cover food and real estate with the New York Post, uh, as far as food goes, can you tell me not your favorite because I don't have a favorite food or anything. It's so hard. People try to ask me all the time. What is a, something, a highlight experience, any culinary highlight experience that you've had that you'll remember for the rest of your life that just stands That's a out? Good question. It was similar to the question I was going to ask you, but okay, here goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, this was a really um, beautiful experience, so I'll, I'll share it, but it was the last night, real, my last dinner out, really, and it was fr um, March 14th. And it was a beautiful restaurant. Um, now, if I don't remember the name, I'm going to go crazy because it was new. But it's behind, it's sort of like the the entrance is an art gallery. I think it's Frevo, F-R-E-V-O. And you, you go inside and um, there's a beautiful long counter and a fabulous chef and sommelier and... Um, the food was incredible with a chef who'd worked at all the top restaurants, but what made it so special um, was um, the person I was with and we were celebrating something special, but also um, this restaurant was a dream for this one couple and, and their friends and it was a beautiful dream and they created something so beautiful and I loved everything about it. And it's also so sad that that it was just starting to gain traction when everything shut down. Um, but it was a really, really special evening. So um, that's my that's my story. And even then, there were hardly any people out. People were starting to not go out. The city was almost shut down, and. Um, 
And it was just a really good feeling to be out and about and to see people still coming to New York City to follow their dreams, to live their dreams, and, and to create really special, magical moments. Uh, I love that. So it was an experience and also the story behind how it was created. Yeah, uh, the food was incredible. Their story for putting the restaurant together and how they did it was really magical. So that's, that's my story. I love All right, so. That. <laughs> and I'm going to get you the name. Maybe we can put it on the okay. in segment too. Um, and then, okay. So for you, what what neighborhood do you miss, and and what do you miss, and what are you excited to go back to when the city reopens? You just totally threw me for a loop because I thought you were going <laughs> to ask me a similar question. <laughs> so my mind was already I, already. I already had an answer. <laughs> um. I, I love Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I lived there before moving to Bushwick. I, I lived there for probably eight or nine years, probably nine years. So before change was happening, but before change really. It's a, I love it there. It's so great. Yeah. And um, I just, I, I miss because I lived there for so long. I have so many friends in that area. And I miss uh, some of the restaurants because my friends were always there. But there's actually a bar there that I love called The Crack. And I don't know, do you know it? I don't think I know that oh, okay. one. I used to spend more time in Williamsburg than I do these days, but. It's, you know. Imagine this Irish bar that is completely unassuming. You have to walk down the stairs to go into this basement, but glass front uh, on the, on the, in the basement. And you walk in, I full on Irish bar, but beautiful cocktails, amazing music. And the people that go there are always so nice. And it's just this vibe. It's always this positive energy. So Williamsburg is a place that I miss tremendously. The crack I, I miss and just that whole area and the waterfront, the park. And, you know, I used to run down Kent Avenue on the jogging path during the summer. Right. Just that whole feeling for me is just what I miss. Like, dr I dramatically miss it. I just, you know what I mean? It's like I'm at a point where I just want to break into the crack <laughs> and just be in denial about it and just act as if it's business, it's I'm normal. Good. That sounds really good. Yeah, but it's not a, it's not as as classy and as beautiful of an experience as you have. But <laughs> you know. Okay, we had at the post we had Langans, which we all loved. We loved hanging out there. So different where? different scenario, but I'm sorry, where was that, Jennifer? You said a, it was a place near near the New York Post. Okay. Our pub that we loved. So. Yeah, I mean, and there's so many amazing restaurants in Williamsburg too. Yes. It's a, the caliber of restaurants in Williamsburg is to me just remarkable. The creativity, I love it. Yeah. And the energy is great. Yeah. So, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining a Facing Time conversation. It was an absolute pleasure we got to do this. I really, uh, uh, I'm so grateful that, that you came on and, and you spoke with me today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Well, it was fun. It was really fun. All right, can I look to see if I can find this the name? I feel so bad that I said that without the name of the restaurant. No, it's okay. So, you know what? I, I tell you what, we're going to, we'll, I'll make sure I put this in the, um, in the cap, in the caption down below. So the it was one thing that, I was right. F-R-E-V-O. Okay. So you got it. West 8th Street. Yeah. Yeah, if you put it on the caption below, that would be amazing. Okay, awesome. So thank you everybody for joining Facing Time with Jared Zuckerman and Jennifer Gould with the New York Post, an author. And I, what I always say, stay positive. Absolutely. <laughs>